This call is now being recorded. That was well. All right, then. I'd like to call to order this regular meeting of the Boulder Valley Board of Education for Tuesday, May 24th, 2022. Laura, would you please call the roll? Garcia. Here. Gebhardt. Here. Nisnik. Here. Rajpal. Here. Sargent. Here. Sweeney Moran. Here. Ziss. Here. Thank you. Before we go into the agenda, I'd like to call for a moment of silence for all of us to think about the families who were impacted in Texas. I don't know what else to do, and I don't know that there are any words to say, so I would just like us to all reflect in our own way for a moment of silence and send our healing thoughts, if we can, to the Texas families. So it's with a heavy heart that we will proceed. Um, I am sure each one of us is touched in a different way, but thank you for, for taking that time with all of us collectively. I'd like to remind everybody that the mission of the Boulder Valley School District is to create challenging, meaningful, and engaging learning opportunities so that all children thrive and are prepared for successful, civically engaged lives. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us electronically on BV22. We're glad to have you observe and participate in this meeting. At this, mo at this point, I would like to entertain a motion to amend the agenda so that we can add an action item to number 10 on our agenda that will address our board calendar for the month of June. So do we have a motion for that? So moved. And a second? Nicole? Laura, can you call the roll? Garcia? Yes. Gephardt? Yes. Nisnik? Yes. Rajpal? Yes. Sargent? Yes. Sweeney Moran? Yes. Ziss? Yes. Motion passes. So now I would like to see if there's a motion to approve the amended agenda. Stacy? Yes. Kitty, second. Roll. Garcia? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Gebhardt? Yes. Nisnik? Yes. Rajpal? Yes. Sargent? Yes. Sweeney Moran? Yes. Is this? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. So as always, we'll begin with the superintendent's report. Dr. Anderson, good evening. Thank you, Board President Gephardt, members of the board. Um, I'd like to also start by just uh, sharing that our hearts with the families of the 18 students and one teacher um, that were killed today in the school shooting in Uvalde, Texas, which is about an hour and a half west of San Antonio. Um, as a community, we've been through um, through the King Super shooting, and so um, I'll be reaching out to see how we could support um, the, the students in the schools um, in Uvalde, uh, Texas, uh, this week. So we were excited to con to finish up our BVSD Connects sessions, as the public might or might not know, and certainly the board knows that we had four parent engagement sessions uh, over the course of the past month, two in English, two in Spanish. This is a, something we plan on doing every semester um, as a way to just connect with our families and our community. We had great co conversations covering a wide range of topics and excellent feedback that we'll um, certainly um, take under consideration as we think about our planning for the summer and into next year. And so I want to thank all of our parents, um, our school staff, uh, students, everybody who was able to come out and join us on those meetings. I want to thank board members as well who were able to, to be there to listen and also um, our senior staff that was able to be there to help s to present and listen. Oh, we had an exciting um, situation at Fairview High School over the past week. Uh, board members, you may have seen this in the media, but Fairview students and staff had the opportunity to connect with 2006 Fairview grad and NASA astronaut Jessica Watkins and one of her colleagues from the International Space, uh, Space Station. Uh, students had a chance to give some advanced questions for, um, for both astronauts and um, Watkins, who's part of the Artemis program, which aims to return to the U.S. In the, return the U.S. to the moon 
um, before heading out to Mars, spoke about how her time at Fairview set her up for success. So incredibly proud moment. Uh, we're very proud of Jessica and all that she's accomplished and a, just a great tribute to the quality of education that, that BVSD provides. So we're in the midst of graduation season. Most of our graduations, um, 10 of our 12 high school graduations have be already been held over the past week. Uh, nearly 2,600 graduates, uh, just incredible ceremonies uh, throughout throughout BVSD. Um, Justice High School is tomorrow and New Vista is on Saturday and then we will have all of our graduations completed. I want to thank board members who were able to join us, uh, staff members who were able to join and, and, um, and celebrate um, what were really, really special days, certainly special for me. My daughter uh, is a 2022 graduate of Monarch High School and uh, just such a, such a proud moment and so just really was great to celebrate uh, with everyone. Um, and I want to thank our team for being able to adjust on the fly to make sure that graduations happened. Um, now, I was telling some folks uh, at, one of the, uh, at, the, at one of the ceremonies, you know, booking a venue, an indoor venue, or any graduation venue is not like booking a, a four top at Chili's. Uh, you have to, you have to, you have to really think in advance in regards to what you need. All the these are major contracts. Um, and uh, six months ago, if you would have had to place a bet on whether we would have pandemic-related re um, restrictions or a seven-inch snowstorm in the end of May, um, I think most of us would have done <laughs> what, uh, what we ended up doing, which was decided to have those outside. We had those successfully two years in a row this year. Um, Friday and Saturday were certainly a challenge, put a wrench in our graduation plans. Um, I want to really thank Carrie Jensen from the from the operations facilities team. Um, she was able to secure First Bank Center. I know that it was an inconvenience for some families. I know that some of our family members weren't able to participate um, or able to, to watch the graduation live because of travel restrictions, because of the late change. But um, the, our facilities team just did an amazing job to come up with the backup plan for what was our backup plan. Uh, I, yeah, say that 10 times. Um, uh, just uh, again, a team worked to, to orchestrate not only First Bank Center, a big thank you to Broomfield Police who was very flexible, worked with us, made it happen. Um, thank you to the facilities team who then on Saturday morning woke up and shoveled seven inches of snow off of wrecked field to make sure that we were able to have all of our ceremonies on Sunday. Um, our facilities team. Um, just, just an incredible, incredible job. And so just want to thank everyone and want to thank all of our families for being flexible with us as we've had to adjust. Um, you know, it was, uh, just beautiful ceremonies and, and really just appreciate everyone's flexibilities. And that is all I have for superintendent comments this evening. Board members, any questions? And we'll move on to our next item, which is public participation. Members of the public who wish to speak at tonight's meeting were asked to sign up prior to noon today by submitting the request to speak during public participation form that can be found on the BVSD website or by contacting the board secretary, Laura Schaefer. Public participants have the option to attend the meeting in person or join and present their comments via Google Meet. The board respects the rights of the public to speak on matters concerning the operation of the schools. We believe that public comments that are critical of district staff, however, often cause unnecessary harm to those employees and to the education of our students. As a result, we prefer that members of the public share any criticisms of employees in writing with the superintendent, who is responsible for supervising all staff and then involving the board as necessary. If you choose instead to address a personnel issue publicly, please understand that the board does not endorse the comments of any speaker and reminds all who speak that they assume the risk of legal action by district employees in the event the affected employees believe that any comments about them violate legal standards. To ensure that our meeting is conducted in an orderly manner, we ask the persons who address the board confine your comments to matters that are germane to the business of the school district. Speakers on agenda items will be heard first, followed by those speaking to non-agenda items. Limit your presentation to two minutes. 
If we go over the, we will not go over the first hour, so never mind. <laughs> Recognize that students often attend or view our meetings. Speakers' remarks, therefore, should be suitable for an audience that includes kindergarten through 12th grade students. I may interrupt, warn, warn or terminate a participant statement that is unrelated to the business of the district or inappropriate for K-12 students. This video be, will be recorded for public viewing in perpetuity. BVSD reserves the right to remove you from the meeting if your video includes material that is inappropriate for the public or BVSD students. You will see a yellow card when you have 30 seconds remaining. When you have 10 seconds, you will see the orange card. Please wrap up your comments at the end of your two minutes. A timer will sound and your microphone will be muted. Tonight we have one speaker who's been given an additional two minutes. We have Michael Guidarelli, who has been given two minutes by Sean Shiamataro. Did I get that right or is it the reverse? I got it right? Okay. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Superintendent Anderson, members of the board, staff, and honored guests. My name is Michael Guidarelli. I'm in my ninth year driving school bus routes for BVST. This year I take elementary students from San Juan to Columbine, and then I gather students from San Lazaro and San Juan and take them to Casey Middle School. My students are predominantly Hispanic, live in either Section 8 housing and, or mobile homes, and encounter challenges often daily that I have never had to experience either as a child or as an adult. I'd like to focus on my middle school students for a moment. In my humble opinion, they're just as smart, talented, and athletic as any other group of middle schoolers in BVSD or in the state of Colorado for that matter. Two of them have helped translate my English to Spanish to a student who recently moved here from Mexico. All middle schoolers need among other things, are to be challenged, to learn discipline, to be appreciated, to be utilized, to be acknowledged, and to take responsibility. Where am I going with this? I have told my middle schoolers several times this school year that they have an amazing gift that I don't possess. They are bilingual. If one of them and I were 18 years old, going after the same job, and we each had the same skill set, except for the fact that they were bilingual and I was not, they would get the job 95% of the time. <clears throat> so why can't we utilize their gifts more during school hours? I used to do a TAG shuttle, which stands for Talented and Gifted, from Casey Middle School to Boulder High, taking middle school students to Boulder High to take higher level math or science classes. Here's some suggestions. We could do the reverse, send bilingual middle schoolers from Casey to Columbine to help Spanish speakers learn English or English speakers learn Spanish. Have bilingual Casey students help other Casey students who need help to learn English. Have bilingual Casey students help Boulder Valley employees like me learn more Spanish so I can communicate better on the bus and with their parents when I have an issue with the student. Help Casey administrators who are overwhelmed to help with translating in meetings with parents at school. Or help teach basic Spanish to students at Sacred Heart of Jesus next door. Now these are examples. Spanish is the most spoken language in the Western Hemisphere. And in uh, North, South, and Central America, there's over 400 million Spanish speakers, approximately 300 million English, approximately 210 million Portuguese, and less than 20 million French speakers. The five most spoken languages in the world, according to Berlitz, English and Mandarin are almost neck and neck at 1.1 billion. Hindi is, has about 620 million. Spanish is fourth with 534 million and growing fast, and French is in fifth with 280 million. <clears throat> Translating is a vocation that transcends all sectors of the economy. Education, science, real estate, retail law, sports, and so on. 
by offering more outlets to our middle schoolers to utilize their bilingual gifts. We will help them on many levels, self-confidence, self-respect, motivation to continue to improve, acknowledgement for their services, and ripple effects in their other subjects. I'd certainly like feedback from, from the staff on this. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Guadarelli. I'll get it right one of these days. I apologize for betraying your last name. Call me Guido. <laughs> okay, thank you, Guido. Um, that concludes our public participation for the night, and then we will move on to board communication. Who wants to go first? Stacy? I just want to echo Dr. Anderson's thanks to all the staff that made the graduations possible. Um, once again, they did an amazing job, and they were great events. And this year in particular, um, being able to do what they did from moving Saturdays to Friday and Sunday morning, and it, it was truly amazing. Anyone who came would never have thought that the First Bank Center wasn't the first plan. Um, it was all done very well, and um, just wanted to send my thanks for that. And congratulations to all the 2022 graduates. Kitty? Yeah, I'll echo what Stacy said. Um, I've been to so far 10 of the graduations and I used to hate going to graduation and now I love it. I love seeing the students. I love hearing what they have to say, seeing different kids, different expressions when they're walking across the stage. I mean, some kids are so excited and others look like they're being carted off to jail. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure it has to do with nerves and everything, but it's just been, it's such a privilege to be able to attend. And I do want to give a huge shout out to all of the staff that helped make this happen. And to the staff that were having a hard time getting parents from one school to get off the field so that parents from the next school can get on. And um, it was just, it was such a lovely experience, those 10 graduations. And I'm looking forward to going to two more. Richard? I also echo uh, Stacy and, and Kitty remarks in terms of the graduation. I thought it was wonderful. And I also want to salute the 2022 graduates uh, and hope that they pursue and accomplish whatever they're going to accomplish after high school. Um, yeah, and I want to thank uh, operations and uh, all the staff, uh, including the office staff that I saw that were greeting parents and having a hard time with parents. Uh, and I do want to mention something about that, that hopefully maybe next graduation we have a set of guidelines in terms of ethical behavior as it relates to parents because no, they definitely had a hard time with some of the parents. They were rowdy and unpolite and you know, so anyhow. So, uh, uh, and I also want to thank Michael. Michael, thank you so much for your kind words, especially around bilingual, bilingualism. I think what you just said is right on, spot on. And, uh, and uh, you know that we are doing some work around improving our uh, pathways to bilingualism here in Boulder Valley Schools. So thank you for your comments. Nicole? I also want to say congratulations to the 2022 graduates and all of their families. It was a pleasure to attend the graduation ceremonies over the weekend and early last week. Um, and I also want to say congratulations to all of our heroes that were honored last night at the Impact in Education Awards. It was great to see our staff being celebrated in what has been a very challenging year, and uh, they deserve all the, all the praise that, that we can give them. So thank you for Impact and helping uh, run that event and for all that our staff has done this year. Beth? Yeah, I think I'll uh, jump on board as well here and uh, agree with everyone that congratulations, class of 2022. Huge accomplishment in spite of all the obstacles and odds that were put in front of you. I uh, had the honor of joining Dr. Anderson, uh, Nicole, and Kathy last night at the Impact on Education Awards, and it was really uplifting and amazing, even though it was cold <laughs> and kind of exhausting to be outside in the rain. It was uplifting, uplifting and amazing to see uh, the recognition of our incredible staff, um, teachers, paraeducators, 
uh, faculty, facility staff members, everybody. It was it was great and a nice way to uh, to to wind down the year. Lisa. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to congratulate our graduates and, and all of our students and staff who've made it through another year. Um, but I think really I'm finding it tough to sit in this meeting tonight and pretend to care about any of the things that are on our agenda. The fact that we're living through a mass shooting of children again is unacceptable. And I think we all know what we need. We need stricter gun control measures and we need universal background checks and we need to keep weapons of war off our streets and we need to do all of the things that every other country that doesn't struggle with this consistently is doing to keep our families safe. I think the people of our country have been so clear that we know better and that we expect better and the fact that special interest lobbies matter more to our representatives than families and children. Um, is disgusting. It's not a secret formula. We are the only place where this occurs regularly, and we don't have to live like this. It's not something that happens to us. It's something that our representatives choose. They choose money and guns over children, um, and we choose to let them stay in power when they do. And if we can't keep kindergartners safe from mass shootings, I mean, what the hell are we doing? So I just want to say that I hope everyone watching this meeting today or sitting in this meeting today We'll call every lawmaker that represents you tonight and we'll demand better, demand no more contributions from the gun lobby, demand immediate change, demand real gun control measures be passed, and demand that they not say a single word about thoughts and prayers unless they're actually going to do something that makes a difference. Um, and if it doesn't happen, you know, vote them out and vote for somebody who will represent you. Well said, Lisa. I don't think I could say it any better. I hope that her call to action people will take to heart and actually step up. Um, I just have a few more things that I'd like to add. Um, first, I'd like to add a heartfelt thanks to Andrew Moore. I think this may be his last meeting. I'm not sure. But he has guided us through um, all sorts of turmoil and all sorts of obstacles with grace and with knowledge and with skill. And we will really miss you, Andrew, and we wish you all the best. And don't be a stranger, because um, you'll have to drive by us, I think, on, on your way to your new job. So anyway, thank you for everything you've done for, for helping drag us into the 21st century and helping us get computers to everybody. And so can we just have a round of applause for Andrew? I don't have much to add to the comments tonight. Um, I was also at the impact um, ceremony last night. And I remember what I said last year. It was an impact, but it was when Rob was doing the awards for all of the staff. And I, I think you have a, a, a second career as a stand-up <laughs> because <laughs> you were given like five different notebooks and five different scripts and it's raining and we're trying to make it look like we all know what we're doing up there when in fact none of us really knew what we were doing, including the three of us. <laughs> and it went off very smoothly. Um, so thank you for, <laughs> for getting us through that smoothly. And, and thanks to Impact and to Allison Billings for all the great work she did in getting that put together because that was a lot of work. Um, and it was a lot of work to honor all the work that's been done by the staff. So it was really encouraging. And what I loved was seeing the schools that were there to support their awardees. So you would see whole schools jumping up when one of their um, staff would be getting an award. And I just loved the, the community support that was gathering around those, those teachers and staff. Um, and one other thing I just want to mention. So Nicole and I and um, Rob Price and Dr. Anderson toured um, the Technology Center um, in Adams 12. And it's a great place. And I'm hoping that at some point um, we can have others go view it. Because it's not like built to like this Taj Mahal. It is very, very um, practical. And it serves all of their students. They have waiting lists. One of the programs that I was really impressed with, because I know we're all talking about trying to figure out how we help our students have a path forward after, after high school, is their welding program. You start as a sophomore, you get two years of welding experience. And when you're a senior, you're out in the field. You're hardly ever in the classroom. 
Um, and they have other programs that are like that too in the construction trades and in diesel engines. And it's a really impressive program. And so it's just helpful to see what other districts are doing and what we can model some of our, as we try to figure out where we're going in, with our bond and where we're going with our future education for our students. I think it's really helpful to see those kinds of facilities and to talk with others who have gone through that and who have built those kinds of facilities. So thank you to Rob and Rob for setting that up. And um, I look forward to continuing those conversations. And then a uh, final thanks to, to Rob and to Randy for putting on the, the connects with our, our, you pulled off four of them in, no, in hardly any time. And I know it was a lot of work to do that. And um, I'm really looking forward to what we do next year to try to continue to reach out to our community and so they can start to kind of predict when we're gonna be having these meetings and understand that they can come and talk with us and that we will be more present in the community assuming no other future pandemics or monkey pox bring us down. So um, anyway, that's, that's all I have. Does anybody have anything else, Richard? Yeah, I just forgot to say that I wanna thank Rob and I wanna thank Rosanna uh, from KGNU. Uh, I had the pleasure of uh, sitting with Rob on a, for a whole hour of an interview on bilingual education. So it was fun. Anything else? All right, then we'll move on to um, our information item. And the first item up is our legislative report. And I'd like to have Taylor Hickerson and Tanya Kelly Bowery come up and present to us. It's been a pleasure working with both of you. It's been every session you think it can't get more tumultuous, and then I think it does. So you guys um, have guided us through and taken hard positions um, and stood up for us in difficult circumstances. And we're deeply appreciative, and we're looking forward to hearing. And Rob? And, and before they get a chance to speak, um, I want to make sure that I thank Tanya and Taylor, Taylor for all of your hard work this year at the Capitol, advocating for our, our board's legislative priorities, fighting the good fight, helping us um, gather folks to, to pay attention to things that would have been bad for public education, um, and just continuing to, to serve us incredibly well and being great partners. So before you tell us about all the fun that you had at the Capitol this session, I just wanted to give you a heartfelt thank you. Um, Tanya Kelly Bowery, President of Policy Matters, and very pleased to introduce my colleague, Taylor Hickerson, um, who was just an incredible asset this year at the Capitol. Um, I truly want to engage both our Superintendent Anderson and President Gephardt, countless conversations late at night, early in the morning. Um, uh, I think we had an incredible amount of work coming from your leadership. Uh, we were very pleased to meet mo almost, actually we met all of the board members on Zoom. Um, and it's so nice to be here in this beautiful boardroom in person. Uh, we somewhat got back to a bit of a normal session this year, although um, it still was quite challenging with the number of different budget cycles. And so uh, we have a pretty comprehensive report we'd like to get into. But again, so pleased to represent the students. Quiero decir gracias también a El bus driver, gracias por todo su apoyo para los estudiantes. Um, as a bilingual individual and someone who's Latina from the San Luis Valley, I really espouse the work that Boulder Valley has done. I think having um, Dr. Anderson come on board and looking at this as a priority, I know um, Dr. Garcia, Richard has been pounding me for years to make sure we do the bilingual education front, so it's nice to have leadership that is engaged. Uh, but again, very honored to represent you all at the Capitol. Uh, and we did have quite an exciting and invigorating session. So I'd love to turn it over to Taylor to talk a little bit um, or a lot about the key legislation we worked on. I'll wrap up with a couple of big bills and then we wanna talk about elections and some really strategic work that we want to engage the board on um, with our leadership going into this interim in the fall. So thank you, Taylor, turn it over to you. Hello, Taylor Hickerson. Again, it's great to be with you all, especially in person, not on little screens anymore. Um, I'll dive right in. We thought it would be helpful to first start with a general overview of what we saw done at the state capitol and then narrow into that K-12 world. Um, some uh, big themes that we saw, first of all, was one-time spending. As you may all remember, in 2021, the state received $3.8 billion from the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, most of it was spent through bills this year. So we had a, lots and lots of bills, and they were not small by any means, both in terms 
terms of fiscal note and then content as well. On top of that, there was a lot of one-time state spending as well, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about the state budget process, especially in the school finance realm. Um, but there was a lot of one-time spending, so lots of big bills. Part of that one-time spending was also for air quality. Um, so as it relates to schools, there was a $65 million allocation for electric school buses. So that is one thing that you all will be hearing more about as well. Within that as well, there's also a few minor bills of standing up multiple department agencies. One that we watch really closely is the Department of Early Childhood, um, which we'll talk, Tanya will talk about our work in that space. Um, that was obviously a very big lift. A lot of this was also prompted by the upcoming elections. As you may all recall, in 2021, we went through a redistricting process in Colorado. Um, so folks who typically had very safe seats all of a sudden found themselves in very competitive. Um, so they had to really be strategic about the bills that they ran, how they voted, and what they set up on the mic. Um, so we'll talk about the election, as Tanya mentioned as well, but those key factors really determined what happened January through May down at the state capitol. Um, so moving back over to school finance, typically this is our big headliner, but this year was a little bit quieter. Um, the at beginning in January, they talked about buying down the budget stabilization factor. They were very hopeful the budget committee was able to do that. But unfortunately, in March, we received the March revenue forecast, which indicated strong general fund, but unfortunately with a high inflation rate. This gave members a lot of pause in doing any of those ongoing fund investments. So what they ended up doing, I want to make sure I get my numbers correctly, reduced the budget stabilization factor to $321.2 million set next year's total program funding at $8.42 billion. So that's an average of $9,559 per student and added $300 million to the state education fund. Um, so again, not exactly what we were expecting, but at least moving in that right direction. A few other bills that touched that school finance was Senate Bill 127, which put $80 million into special education. Senate Bill 202, which puts $10 million in state funds to match low value school districts that want to seek mill levy overrides. And then Senate Bill 238, which makes reductions in real property taxation for only the 23 and 24 property tax. I know there were some questions about that. The bill also does direct the state treasurer to transfer $200 million from the general fund to the public school fund to offset school districts property tax reduced um, reduction in revenue. So we'll continue to keep an eye on that um, and then continue to push for that bubble budget stabilization factor. And then I'll move over into big bills as well. Again, Tanya will round us out with early childhood, so that's on the docket. Don't worry, I'm not missing that one. Um, to start off, we worked on House Bill 1358, Clean Water in Schools and Child Care Centers. Um, this was a really big one. It was supposed to receive ARPA dollars in order to have filters put into all schools. Um, we worked very closely with the proponents and bill sponsors from with BVSD experts to talk about what really this lift would be, both in terms of workforce, in terms of maintenance. This would have been a really big unfunded mandate how the bill was originally introduced. It ultimately got amended down, so now it just includes testing and remediation. I mean, is in theory, fully funded through the state that they will pay for all of those. It's a two-step program where it will focus on K through five schools to start and then expand through six through eight in 2024 if funds are available. They'll look back at 2026 at the data collected and determine whether that's a program they want to continue doing, make adjustments, or expand. So that's one that we worked very closely with and we got a lot of kudos from bill sponsors and proponents for playing nice in the sandbox. Um, the next one was House Bill 1260, the Medically Necessary Services for Students. This was another one that was going to be a huge lift on school districts if it was to be passed as it was originally introduced. Um, essentially, it allowed anyone and anyone who had medically necessary, however they defined that, and however they determined care to come into schools to be provided. Um, there was a lot of liability issues there, and so we worked really closely with those bill sponsors. Um, we ultimately got it down to a strike below that really left most of the power in the state board to determine what is considered medically necessary in creating those different rules. So that'll be kicked over to rulemaking, which I think got us to a place of a little bit more comfort. Next bill is House Bill 1414, Healthy Meals for All Public School Students. Um, this was another one that got a lot of press, and I know there was a lot of questions about it. To give a little background, it started as a different Senate bill um, and essentially wanted to fund, I think it was 60 to $90 million by their projections of general fund to provide healthy, school, or healthy meals in schools. That was obviously a very big lift and would be taking funds from other areas in education. So that bill died because of its big fiscal note. It shifted to now being a ballot measure, so you'll see it in November, um, that will have deduction, tax deductions for taxpayers at $300,000 or more, and that's how that will be funded. 
If that ballot measure does pass, the program is optional, so school districts can decide to participate or not, and it can be used also as supplemental, because I know that Boulder Valley School Districts already has a very high standard for public school meals, um, so it can be used to support that. It doesn't have to be competing dollars. Um, so that one we will be seeing now, and if you have any questions on that one as well. I will just note with that, ballot measures are incredibly difficult to pass, um, statewide ones, as you all know, um, especially I think this year was such a long ballot. By the time folks get to those ballot measures, it's a little bit difficult, but not impossible by any means. The last bill I wanted to highlight was Senate Bill 207, Title IX in Public Schools. Um, this was a really important one that we had Dr. Anderson and Kathleen Sullivan work directly with the bill sponsors on, just to give a district perspective, especially because Boulder Valley School District has had lots of lessons learned and has a lot of on the ground experience with this. Um, the proponents and the bill sponsors were very appreciative of our work and that open communication. Ultimately, it got reduced down to doing a one-year study that will be coming back next year. Um, they have already expressed their interest in having us partner with them and just be a thought partner in how they can make sure that bill is something that is workable, but that also serves everyone in the district well. So I will pause right there, and I will let Tani talk about the little small early childhood bill, just minor. Um, just a couple of the big ticket items, um, and I do really, again, want to um, thank our superintendent for the work that we started on this. I think uh, Kathy and Rob and I had a call with the president of the Senate way back before the session even started, I think in December, um, to really look at the Early Childhood Act and how the implementation was going to occur. Of course, we're all committed to early childhood. We want to make sure that what they put together was actually implemented so that it would function. Um, the the, bar, the bill still fell significantly further from the mark, but we were very, very pleased that um, thanks to the leadership of Senator Barbara Kirkmeyer as well as Senator Tammy Story and Senator Rachel Zenzinger, we were able to get an amendment that Rob actually wrote himself that crafted um, around the local control organizations or the basically the local authorities that are going to be setting up the early childhood facilities. Not all of them have to be done directly with the districts themselves. And so we said that we could not necessarily divide up. Boulder Valley has Broomfield, we have Boulder County, we have a, a number of different organizations that cover our district and students and that they could not just come in and parse those up without approval of the board and an official vote in terms of notifying us and so that we could have that control. Um, we actually did receive quite a bit of good feedback from Case, CASB, as well as the Rural Caucus for the leadership role that we played to really protect the districts um, because many districts are in the same boat as we are in terms of um, having some of those different service areas. And so um, we're pleased that we were able to get that on and it did pass unanimously. I think we were texting each other up until midnight that night in committee uh, trying to get that amendment on. Um, I think the bill still remains to be seen how it's implemented. Um, there were still uh, some pretty significant governance issues that we had with the final proposal that was signed into the law by the governor. Uh, we will continue to work very, very closely on that. Um, as, as you know, the bill was 485 pages, was dropped the week before and then fast-tracked through the legislature. So it was a real battle um, trying to get some of these amendments and some clarification language on. We do want to thank our other colleagues who also testified and I think we really got the moment momentum going. Uh, Kathy made a lot of key phone calls that were strategic and Rob reached out to all of the other superintendents so that we could get a coalition. Uh, very pleased about the partnership we had with St. Vrain, um, whose lobbyist also played a key role in working with Taylor and I to assist us on the vote counting for that bill. Um, the other big ticket item that I think is very important to our um, Boulder staff and employees is that the para bill that Representative Shannon Bird did offer finally passed the last week of the legislative session. As you all recall, during the coronavirus, they had to suspend the $225 million of payments to make sure that PARA was solvent. With that suspension, it triggers and impacts because of the way the triggers work for PARA becoming solvent and making sure that we pay off and keep our ability to both the employer and employees. Um, that money was not restored, unlike many of the other areas that had been cut and were restored. We were very pleased because of the lobbying efforts we did. We did, we were able to get that money back in. And um, I think the bill has not been signed yet, so I need to check on that. But uh, Representative Bird was very appreciative for the efforts that we did in working with our, our partners in that regard. 
Um, as Taylor mentioned, I think one of the big issues that we're really looking at this year are the re-election campaigns. Um, the redistricting process was quite challenging. The other piece that was unique in terms of the budget, we really saw three budget cycles this session um, because of the ARPA bills, because of the stimulus bills, and then the normal general fund November 1 budget request. So we were almost lobbying three separate budget issues simultaneously during a legislative session. The other piece that was quite significant was that there is a huge Tabor refund. And what that means is, while they are still very desperate to pay for general fund and services, as we mentioned, we were really hoping to bring the negative factor down to pay that off. But because of the Tabor refund, you cannot do that because you don't have ongoing spending. Many of that money, once it reaches the cap, has to be refunded to the public. Even though there are needs um, for different key priorities to be spent on, that's just the constitutional requirement that we're under to have a balanced budget. Um, so that, I think, posed quite a challenging process for us and, and kind of hard to explain to people why if we're flush with money, we're not able to fully go back and take care of a lot of the pending issues that have been out there. Um, uh, again, primary election will take place on June 28th. I think you'll see a lot of results come out of that. Um, typically in our districts, uh, most of our folks um, aren't necessarily in cycle, but the primary is what sort of dictates who will win. Um, for Senate District 15, Rob Woodward is running against Janice Marchman, who's the Democrat. Um, Tammy Story was redistricted out of her Senate seat and was put into a much more challenging uh, Republican-leaning uh, seat. And so she is opting, I believe, to run for the State House. She'll be running um, against a current sitting incumbent legislator, Representative Colin Larson, um, who uh, uh, was one of the key sponsors of the early childhood education bill. Um, Senator Hawkins Lewis is not in cycle this year. She's in the middle of her four-year term, along with President Fenberg, um, who's in the middle of his term. For those of you who may not know, or for members of the audience, there was a leadership shift this year with the President of the Senate, Leroy Garcia, stepping down because he was appointed to the Department of of defense by President Biden. And so our own Senator Steve Fenberg became the president of the Senate, was elected by his colleagues. Um, and the majority leader caused a shift on the Joint Budget Committee. Dominic Moreno was uh, voted by his colleagues to move from the Joint Budget Committee to leadership. And that's when Senator Zenzinger, who's a huge education advocate, and it's good for us on the Joint Budget Committee, because we now have Madam Chair Julie McCluskey, who's been a huge asset for K-12, as well as Senator Zenzinger that are really fighting um, for those funds. Um, Edie Hooten, again, is running against uh, William DeOrio as the Republican, Karen McCormick versus Tara Menza, Tracy Burnett versus Anya Kirvan, and it's um, somewhat of a competitive seat. Um, Shane Black uh, versus Jennifer Leah Parenti. I believe that's Matt Gray's seat. He's announced he's not running for re-election, um, and that will be a very competitive swing seat. And then William Lindstedt versus Stacey Doherty for House District th 33. And then Rep Amabile is running against Catherine Lair and John Caldwell, who do have a primary. Um, it's a pretty significant new addition to Representative Amabile district. They've added Clear Creek, Gilpin, some of Larimer County along with um, traditionally Boulder County. Um, one of the big items that we really wanted to talk about is sort of what we found is that we don't have a lot of representation on any of the education committees, House Ed, Senate Ed, um, or Joint Budget Committee, which has really been challenging for us with our delegation. Um, one of the big things that um, I want to call you Rob, that our superintendent and Taylor and I have talked about is how critical it is for us to work this interim with our board, with the, your leadership, as well as our leadership in cultivating a lot of the members that we think will be coming in to cycle, that K-12 has got to be a priority item. Um, many of the bills that were introduced, which we were able to amend down or water down, were dropped in the middle of the session. Typically, we really want these members to reach out to us as a resource during the interim to help us craft those bills so that when they're actually implemented, they work and that we can serve what their intent is. And so we've really 
thought through wanting to look at a strategic outreach plan, um, not only with the members of our delegation, but really how do we cultivate and work with the other districts? How do we get additional members that serve on the education committees or that have expressed interest in those leadership positions to come and partner with us as leaders and thought makers? Um, so Taylor and I are putting together, I think, a pretty significant engagement plan that we plan to share with Superintendent Anderson. We'd love to engage the board members to join us um, as we reach out. Typically, we want to do some more school tours once we get back in the fall, uh, but I think it's also going to be a series of sort of issue-oriented areas with the legislators. I think the other piece that we're really looking at how we cultivate Taylor and I are planning to do a real legislative outreach trip before the elections occur. Oftentimes, especially in the open seats, you meet with the Democrat, the Republican, and you get your issues on their radar screen so that when they actually get elected, that they say, no, actually K-12 is one of my top priorities. And getting to them before they win often gets us on their portfolio to start talking on the campaign, to use us as a resource, to provide those statistics, and it gets them engaged before they even get elected. Um, now, automatically, one or the other won't win, and so it's more time for us, but getting them in, I think, on the ground up is really something that we think is critical, and so we want to make some of that outreach happen for the board as well as Superintendent Anderson. Um, the other piece that we've talked about is working with the new president of the University of Colorado, Todd Salmon, and how we can really engage the board members as well as the superintendent on really key strategic partnerships. Um, I know we've worked very closely with Chancellor DeStefano in the past, uh, but we have a huge opportunity. Todd was was a Boulder Valley student um, and has grown up here, was a legislator from Boulder Valley, was critical in figuring out um, actually with Representative Jack Palmer, who was our representative at the time, Bill Sutter and I, I think worked on writing the amendment to define the negative factor to make sure that school districts could finally be made whole, which is crazy how long I've been in this job and how long Bill's been in this job. Um, so we really, I think, want to take advantage of that and his expertise as the former budget director. I know a um, good friend of Kathy Gephardt's and her dad, uh, but a big leader here in the community that I think we, we definitely want to tap into. Um, finally, we've got two big items coming up in June. We have the June revenue forecast. Again, um, given the inflationary numbers that Taylor referenced, we've got to watch that closely. This is what dictates and starts predicating what the governor's budget request will be. Um, watching those election cycles, as you know, the governor is in cycle as well to be reelected, um, and a lot of outreach will occur, so we're hoping we can cultivate him on, on that campaign trail to get here and work with us. And then there will be the school finance interim committee, which Taylor has graciously volunteered to strategize and cover for us. Um, it will be interesting to see how that plays out because the current speaker is term limited. Alec Garnett was on the school finance committee um, and Representative McCluskey, who sits on it, is in a very competitive House seat. So uh, we'll see when those meetings occur. But I think um, overall it was a very, very intense session, particularly on K-12 issues. We'd be happy to answer any questions um, and mainly thank all of you for your service and really do want to congratulate and thank Kathy and Rob um, just for their leadership and their partnership with us. Um, along with the rest of your team, I think Bill got several, several text messages. We work very closely. Our legal team's incredible and we're used as a resource. Senator Winter really appreciated the phone call that we did. Um, and I do think she's going to hold us to wanting to do some outreach around the Title IX, as Taylor mentioned. Um, but thank you. I think that's our report for the evening. Thanks. Um, board questions, Richard? Uh, I just want to thank you for that very, very comprehensive report, and I want to thank you for the upgrade on my social position from a Mr. Garcia to Dr. <laughs> Garcia, which I'm not, but thank you very much. Uh, often, very often people confuse me with our former superintendent, who was a Dr. Garcia. No, no, no. I call you, you Doc, Dr. Garcia because of your hija, Lorena. <laughs> <laughs> That's her nickname for you. Whenever we need some institutional memory or history, we call you up because you seem to have been here quite a bit longer, maybe even than Bill Sutter and I. <laughs> well, well, maybe you can talk to Todd Solomon to give me an honorary degree one of these days. Oh, just kidding. Just Happy kidding. to do that. <laughs> By the way, I'm very proud of Todd. He's um, one of my best friends. We've been friends for 30 years. Um, he actually helped make me successful as a lobbyist. When he was on the Joint Budget Committee, I started my lobbying career. I was very, very young, and so was he, and so we stuck together through the years. So it's wonderful to see him 
have and, that opportunity. And that's when I met you, when you lobbied me when I was in the, co in the Commission on Higher Education. I that is correct. I remember you coming to my office and, that is correct. and lobbying the commissioners. I don't know what you got out of that, but... <laughs> <laughs> But thank you so much for that comprehensive report. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And President Gephardt, I owe you a class. So let me know when you need me to come back. I'm thank teaching you all tutoring. very much. I still have a couple. I have a couple questions if oh, others okay. don't. Kitty, did you have a question? Yeah. Okay. Um, there was a, I don't remember the bill number, but I remember that Bill Sutter testified on it. It was taxes on construction supplies or something like that and it was just a few of us that um, the municipalities cons consistently were applying taxes. Do you remember that? Bill's shaking his head. Did that one? There were like four municipalities that were trying to get that. It was Representative Bird was running that bill. Did that die? Do you know that... which one, Taylor? I'm going to defer to Taylor okay. on this one. I apologize. Bill, do you know what happened to that? I believe it passed. Um, there was some grumbling from the governor's office, so we had to like, lobby the governor's office to make sure that got signed. But I believe, let me double check to follow up, but I'm fairly sure that that one got signed, if I'm and thinking then, of the correct one. While you're up there, Taylor, is there a, a charge for the um, interim committee for the school finance? Or is I'll it just think of year something. three? <laughs> <laughs> just a policy wonk. I get my own weird but enjoyment the, from learning about school finance, so. I just I'll think about the, it, though. Yeah, if the legislature... I'll get back to you on that one as well. Okay, because I, th I think they, when they set it up, they set it up for three years, and this is just year three, is what I remember. Bill's nodding, so there may not be a separate charge for that. Um, and I just want to say thanks again for... You're right, I, I would look at my phone at 10.30 at night, and I'd have this text from Tanya, are you still up? Because <laughs> that's how, that's how it kind of went. So thank you for your round-the-clock service, um, and it's just been a pleasure working with you. And I can't stress enough that what happens from now until the session is actually almost more important than what happens in the session. So I really appreciate you focusing on that and engaging the board as to what our priorities are going to be. And we might even think about, Rob, figuring out what our legislative platform is sometime in the fall as opposed to December so that we actually can have some time to focus on it and figure out what we want to be doing. So maybe we can look at that when we reconvene in August or September. <laughs> Sounds like a retreat topic potentially. So um, anyway, thank you very much. And I think those were the only questions that I had. And we'll just have to wait and see if there's any amendments we need to bring to the preschool bill. Um, because I think we might need to, because it's almost impossible to implement the way it's currently written. So. so anyway, thank you very much. Thanks for the comprehensive report and for being on speed dial for six months. Really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Rob, do you have anything? OK. All right, thank you. Our final information item is an athletics update with Harry Waterman, who's our district athletic director, and he is going to provide an update to the board. Dr. Anderson? Thank you, Board President Gephardt. Um, very excited to hear from our new Director of Athletics and Activities, uh, Harry Waterman, who, um, as the board and the public will recall, that was this was a budget ad in last year's budget. Very proud of the work that, that Harry has been doing um, around athletics and activities. And uh, tonight's update will just highlight some of that great progress that we're making in this area. And so, Harry, whenever you're ready, I'm turning it over to you. Very good. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And good evening, uh, President Gebhard, members of the board, and Dr. Anderson. Uh, I'm Harry Waterman, Director of Athletics and Activities for the School District, and I'm very excited to present to you uh, updates on what we've done so far this year in the athletic realm in Boulder Valley School District. As COVID protocols have changed over the course of the school year, students have had some wonderful experiences by being able to participate in, in uh, athletics in a more normalized way. In addition, I will provide information about the work this year that has been done by our Athletic Review Committee. My little... And as with all we do in NBVSD, our work is aligned with the components of our strategic plan, all together for all students. We strive in the area of positive and inclusive culture and provide opportunities for students to participate in and have positive experiences in their areas of passion. In addition, we work dilig diligently to partner with our families and community as we support students in these opportunities. 
Of the many highlights from the year, probably the most impactful one is the re-engagement of students uh, in these activities, as we know that for so many of our students, this is the key to their social emotional well-being, academic performance, and connection to school and community. Students have shared their joy of being back in person and being able to participate once again. Numbers of students participating in athletics and activities have continued to increase over the course of the year. We are now back to approximately 80% of our pre-COVID participation numbers. And I have a video here to show you that will speak to this far better than I can. I struggled with my mental health a lot. Still do. I remember just sitting in my parents' office watching my house burn on TV. We lost everything. You just never think that it would strike this close to home. I think grief is, is a very good way to describe it. Everything just felt more difficult. It, there was a, a huge element of burnout. COVID just kind of took a toll on all of us. It was on and off, on and off. This is canceled. This is back open. You could go to this. You can't go to that. And it made it, it, made it brutal. Band was taken away from um, my repertoire of things that I do to um, balance my life. Not being able to do theater was really hard because it was all I ever did. It was what I love to do. So not being able to have that in a traditional aspect was, it really was absolutely heartbreaking. It felt really weird being in a gym, playing basketball without anybody to cheer you on. It was just you, your team, and your coaches. It removed some of the magic of, of life to not be around those people. It just didn't seem like real, you know? I was definitely struggling with not having those people to talk to and not having that support system. It's just not a normal thing to go well, sit at home and just not be able to do anything like that. It's not healthy for anyone like that. I think the best words to use would be lonely and scrambling because I had to find a new hobby. It felt just good to be back with everybody, to be able to do things freely. Two years later, it's finally over with and we're back to normal. There's excitement in the air again. I'm always happy to be here with my friends, my coaches. And just seeing people, just seeing the world again. Losing my house made this place seem even more like home to me. It was just nice to, you know, be around people again, especially for tennis. It's like, oh my gosh, this is awesome, it's wonderful. I was able to like, I fully apply myself to school, I was able to fully apply myself to band. It's kind of cool to like go back and have that time capsule and remember like what it's like to get in the mindset of sports. It's so nice to have my teammates and my family again. Once we got back from COVID, we really bonded as teammates. This past season was so much fun. We got to play at the CU Event Center and we got to return to our like normal things. You can't put a value on what athletics gives to every kid because it's different and because it's immeasurable in how amazing and incredible it is. Reminds us that like we do things as a team, like we do it as a community. Any problems that I have going on, they go away on the court and it's just like fun and it's a way to cope with yourself and like everyone else, so it's exciting. It just brings like chills to you right now thinking about it, uh, running out of the tunnel. Having fans back this year, it made a huge difference. No masks, just seeing everybody's face, smiling. Yeah, I actually get to like interact with everyone on the team. Coming back from COVID really made me appreciate all of these activities. Don't take anything for granted um, because it can all be lost in a second. Powerful coming from our kids. In addition to being able to return to more normal participation, <clears throat> We are also proud of the improvements we've made in the area of technology over the course of this past year to enhance the experiences of our students and families. First, we, wanna, uh, we want to make family and community involvement in our students' experiences more accessible. One example of our current work is we will offer streaming for our, our events uh, for our families across the country to be able to watch their children, grandchildren, friends, siblings, uh, et cetera, participate despite not being able to be there in person. This will be at no cost to the district. So we have a short video clip here that we'd like to show um, for our families and community when this technology is available uh, this, upcoming, this upcoming fall in all, all six of our traditional high schools and in numerous indoor and outdoor events.
Additionally, we have implemented a new registration and scheduling platform for grades six through 12 is another way to make registration for athletics easier for families and team schedules more accessible, uh, accessible I'm sorry, for high school athletics and families. Uh, the registration platform is available in multiple languages. And once a student is registered, initially, all the family will have to do from year to year is update their information, and that information will continue to uh, go on through their time as uh, student athletes in the district. So this should definitely s simplify the process for our parents and our families. In this next slide, there are so many great accomplishments and highlights of our students in athletics this year that we're so proud of. Uh, this list includes athletes that last week Dr. Anderson recognized at the superintendent's honor roll. And along with these previously celebrated, I've highlighted in blue a few additional state champions and other recognitions that have been crowned since last Tuesday. So those additional are Lily Nichols, Broomfield High School. She just competed and won her second, her back-to-back -back, uh, championship in the pole vault as a, an athlete at Broomfield High. And Eddie Siaka from Fairview High School is the unified 100 meter and 200 meter dash state champion in unified sports across the state of Colorado. And he is from Fairview High School. We also have our own Laura Schaefer's daughter, Lee Schaefer, who will be competing in the Special Olympics USA Games in Orlando in just a week and a half. Yes. And we also have Michelle Zhang from Monarch High School, who will be also be keep competing in the USA Games uh, in, in the sport of tennis. And one last, uh, tomorrow night, we hope to add to this list with our Broomfield Girls soccer team will be competing for their back-to-back -back hopeful championship uh, at Dick's Sporting Goods Park at 8 p.m. tomorrow night. So a lot of great things happening. Uh, please uh, join me in congratulating all of these outstanding athletes and our coach of the year, national coach of the year from, from last week that you've recognized. So equally important, but not quite as celebratory, uh, is the work that we have done this year with our Athletic Review Committee. On this slide, you will see the background and formation and the mission of this group. So in 2017, at the request of the Board of Education, uh, the Athletic Review Committee was formed to review the district's high school athletic programming. Fast forward four years and at a global pandemic, and I felt the need to revisit uh, our purpose and reset our goals. In the fall, in 2021, the Athletic Review developed its purpose statement, and it reads, to serve as an advisory committee to assist in identifying, reviewing, and providing recommendations to the district athletic director regarding the direction of BVSD high school athletic programming. We aim to deliver diverse, inclusive, and equitable opportunities for all student athletes. On this slide, you can see the membership of this group. The committee includes high school principals, athletic directors, a community member, and we're especially thankful for our contributions of our school board member, Stacy Ziss, as this is a, a quite a commitment for her. And listed here are the <clears throat> projects and the goals of the Athletic Review Committee for this year and for next. The group worked thoughtfully to clarify uh, the purpose of this committee and to the scope of our ongoing work. The bulk of the work that we have engaged in this year has been the revision of the athletic handbook. We have not, it, it had not been reviewed in a number of years and was in need of updating. It has been a very lengthy and complex process. This work is important in order to stay current with our bylaws uh, as required by CHASA and to update the handbook guidance on the issues that have arisen since the handbook was last updated. An example of this is the use of social media and cell phones as it relates to athletic participation. Next, in collaboration with the operations team, we have walked, reviewed, 
and prioritized our athletic facilities in order to assess the current and future needs in this area. And as we look forward to next year, our work is to center on thoughtfully and thoroughly understanding the demographics of proportionality of students who participate in athletics. Through a lens of equity, we need to be more thoroughly understanding of our current reality in order to create a path forward for increased access for all of our students to ensure equitable and engaging opportunities for all. We are very excited about these goals, and now that we have completed much of the necessary foundational work this year, we are well poised to do a deeper dive next year into the actual experiences of students. We are all hopeful that next year will be much more like a normal year from the very beginning and begin uh, <clears throat> in the beginning and will help us to springboard to understanding how to make student participation in athletics even more accessible and inclusive while providing varied ways in which students in BVSD can participate in athletics. And, and finally, I'd like to leave you with this final video and it's titled, We're Back. After all this waiting and all this time away from school, I can finally jam with my buddies again and dance. It really, really is such a wonderful feeling to be able to play music with the people who I like. We are back with each other, back in a community, and back making great things that we can. It's great to have everyone back and just having fun and getting to be in school again. We're back, baby. No more. I'm glad we could be back with my friends my teachers, my coaches. A place where we can all become together again and have just the school <coughs> diversity and everyone back together. It's just fun. Show up the game, show out, enjoy, go Panthers. I just want to bring us together, we're back. Having that support from other people during matches, you know, especially if I'm down in a match or something and then, you know, getting me back up, it's just been really exciting to be back in this uh, community of people again. Let's go, Nick. Very happy to be back in school and happy to see all my friends. I hope that's the same for you, everyone you guys. PBSD is back and ready to dominate. There's so much to look forward to. So just be excited. Have a blast and give your all at everything. This is the place we want to be, and we're back, baby. At this point, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. That was awesome. Um, Stacy, you got a... I don't have any questions, but um, first, I want to thank Randy Barber and his team for these videos. When he came to the Athletic Review Committee with the idea to make these, wow, mm -hmm. these are amazing. I just, I'm just blown away by them. Um, and I just want to say that we are so lucky in BVSD to have Harry leading us, and we have very, very dedicated athletic directors at our schools, and we're really lucky for that. And working with them, as I have over the past several years since the inception of this group, um, it's just been, it's been great, and they are just so dedicated to our students and for providing opportunities for them. So we're, we're a lucky district. Stacy, thank you, and we appreciate, know that we appreciate you very much. Your guidance and support in that group has been phenomenal, so thank you. And just a reminder, who got like Outstanding Parent of the Year for the athletics? I think it was Stacy Ziss, wasn't it not? So anyway, su she Supportive Board Member of the Year, that was awesome. Richard? Harry, thank you so much for the presentation. I truly appreciate it. Uh, I just want to look at your uh, you know, the the looking forward to 2223 in terms of lens of equity, and a couple of questions: uh, uh, Are you going to be collecting data as it relates to the number of athletes that we have that are from BIPOC uh, uh, students? Uh, 
and uh, do, are you going to be collecting data on the number of coaches that we are that we currently have that are uh, BIPOC? And 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 then if you see a, a lot of disproportionality, there's a, you probably have in your mind how you're going to fix that. So yes, we we've already started on some of that data. Yeah. <clears throat> We are using that to, as we move forward and look at additional and new programs, and we are surveying students to find out what their interests might be, but we're also um, looking at all populations as we do that. So we will gather over this next year again and look at all of our, our data to make sure that we are providing opportunities for all of our kids and in the interest areas that they're, they're of their liking. Is that and you currently have data already to, to look at the propor proportionality of your athletes and also your coaches, right? We have the proportionality surveys right now of numbers um, and gender, but we are going to, as we talked about, a deeper dive next year um, into <clears throat> other areas as well. And so we'll be we, getting a report back on that at some point? Yeah, okay. absolutely. Next year, I hope to have a greater uh, depth of this, of this proportionality. Thank you. Nicole, thanks for that thorough report. A couple questions I had, um, given some of the changes to our Title IX work, our bullying and harassment policies, I was wondering if you've ever considered or if your coaches and parents currently have access to the U.S. Safe, um, safe Sport Training and Certifications. So not that one in particular, but there are a number of opportunities out there for our coaches to get training. and. As a requirement, all first-year coaches are required to have a take a club a course uh, in as a first-year coach, and I'll talk about what's involved in that course. But then any returning coaches have to do that uh, every three years and and take these courses in addition to some of the safety trainings that you have to have concussion and but. Um, they, in that, there's an ethical coach component, and there is an also a component working with um, around relationships with students, with coaches, with parents, uh, officials, the whole gamut. And there's a lot of opportunities um, and requirements for them to do that. We also have a coaches association that we encourage all of our coaches to join, which also provides opportunities for leadership courses as well as just workshops at their um, annual clinics. And uh, there's a lot of opportunities for them to get that additional coaching training there. But some of those are required trainings for all of our, our coaches. And do we offer anything for our parents and our families? I know a part of US Safe Sport, the parents are trained on a lot of the same things that the coaches are to provide a consistent level of information. Is that something that we that you've ever considered of how do we inform the parents about um, about some of those processes? Yeah, so the National Federation, which is the governing body of, of athletics across the country, um, provides a, a number of, they have a whole list of videos that we can provide for our parents. So one thing I did as, as, as a building athletic director is that I would pull up some of those videos to demonstrate, you know, maybe it was around sportsmanship or it was around ethics or whatever it might be and show them, you know, examples of, of great, um, great sportsmanship where teams were picking each other up uh, and, and just showing a gr great sportsmanship there or examples of where it wasn't so good and maybe they opens their eyes a little bit to reflect, wow. <laughs> that was me at one point. And so, yes, there are a lot of videos and a lot of trainings that we can also provide for parents during parent nights, uh, during our back to school, or our, for each season when we provide parents to come, opportunity to come in and learn about the sports seasons and talk about expectations. That's great. Thank you. And then another question, you mentioned the facilities assessment that you did for our athletic facilities. When are we going to hear about our that athletic facility assessment as a board? Or are we going to, is it something we're going to hear about? I'm looking Rob at Rob. maybe speaking to that here shortly. I can address that. Okay. Anyone else? Those videos were awesome, kind of what we needed tonight. So little did you know that when you put them together. But thank you, and thanks for this report. It's just refreshing to feel like maybe we are back and 
And we're all hoping for a good year next year. So thank you for your report and for bringing that to us. You're welcome. Thank you. So are we all right to move on to consent grouping? Does anyone need a break yet? Are we okay to keep going? Okay. Oops. Hold on. You okay? I'm good. Okay. So we'll move on to the consent grouping. 7.1 personnel item, 7.2 approval of minutes, May 10, 2022. 7.3 approval of minutes, May 10, 2022. Approval of minutes, May 17, 2022. Acceptance of donation, Foothill Elementary. Acceptance of donation, Instructional Services and Equity. 7.7 .7, approval of a contract amendment with EcoCycle for recycling and compost hauling services. 7.8 athletic trainer contract for 2022-23. 7.9, change order to the construction manager general contractor contract for bond funded improvement work at Lafayette Elementary School. 7.10, contract amendment to Western Disposal for waste hauling services. 7.11, elementary science material kits. 7.12, fiscal year 23 Go Guardian license renewal. 7.13, INFOR HCM consulting services. 7.14, purchase of new school buses. And 7.15, grant student services Title VII, American Indian Education, U.S. Department of Education. Are there any items board members would like to pull from the consent grouping? Richard? I, uh, I don't want to pull it. I just have a question on 7.15. Okay, we can get to that. Is there anything anybody wants to pull first? And then we can have a discussion. So no, nobody wants to pull anything. Is there a motion um, to pass the consent agenda? So moved. Richard, second. Stacy. All right, Richard, you had a question? Yeah, on these uh, 7.15, uh, on the Title VII uh, grant that we're getting from the feds, uh, it covers one position. And my question really on, on this one here is, uh, how, how do they determine the amount of dollars that we get from the federal government for the Indian, Indian students? and is it the, by number, by number of registered uh, students that we have in our district? And I, I need to know that because I'd like to see what, how that computes in terms of individual students. I mean, and also, second question is, how much are we providing from our general fund to this particular program? So I'm looking at Dr. Messier and Bill. I think we're probably going to have to get back to you on the specifics on that on that response. And so to to clarify, how how does it how are the Title Seven dollars determined per our district? Is it student count? Um, what other general fund dollars that we allocate towards um, some of these things that are listed here? Um, and those were the two big. Those, two, yeah. those were the two big things. We can we can include that um, in our communications on Friday. Board members, any other questions on the consent agenda? Or can you call the roll, please? Garcia. Yes. Gebhardt. Yes. Nesnick. Yes. Rajpal. Yes. Sergeant. Yes. Sweeney Moran. Yes. Zis. Yes. Motion passes. We're going to move on to action steps, um, agenda item eight, and we move to amend that so that we can address the change of our June um, board meetings. Um, what we are proposing is to move the June 28th meeting to June 7th. I need to look at my phone so I have the right dates. And then we would meet um, in June, the first three Tuesdays of the month. Do I have that right? So we would meet June 7th, 14th and 21st. Obviously, if we get all our work done, there's nothing that compels us to have to come, but we'll put those on the calendar and figure out the agendas as we go. But we will cancel the um, meeting on June 28th. So is there a motion to amend our board calendar to hold these meetings as we've talked about? So move. Richard, second. Second, Beth. Can we, any discussion? I understand that by moving this around, some people may have already made plans which they cannot change. So if we understand that, and um, but I think trying to get this the work done and, and end before the end of the of June, I think will work pretty well. So um, 
we'll just see how we can make that work for everybody. Laura, can you call the roll? Yes, for clarification, the meeting that is June 28th, that will be June 7th, correct? Correct. Will that be a regular meeting or will you do change the special meeting work set or um, regular meeting? Regular. Make it a regular meeting? Okay. Does that mean the 14th won't be a regular meeting or all three will be regular meetings? If the seventh is a regular meeting, then the 14th normally wouldn't be. Will it be regular, regular, yeah, special? That's... Correct? Okay. I think so. Huh. <laughs> Someone's listening. <laughs> Okay, Laura, can you call the roll, please? Garcia. Yes. Gephardt. Yes. Nisnik. Yes. Rajpal. Yes. Sergeant. Yes. Sweeney Moran. Yes. Ziss. Yes. Motion passes. Next up on our agenda are our policy study items. We have two policies to study this evening. Our first is policy revisions BDF on advisory committees. Um, Rob, do you want to introduce Kathleen or Kathleen, do you want to just take it away from here? Good evening, board members. Uh, we have two policies uh, tonight for review. Policy BDFF, the Long Range Advisory Committee, is an item that our uh, Director of Operations, Rob Price, will talk more about and has shared with the board previously. Putting that policy back on the agenda for the board's action prompted us to revisit policy BDF that was last discussed by the board in September 2019. We had discussions and then there was this little COVID thing that happened and somehow it never got back on a board agenda. So the primary purpose of the revisions to this policy BDF or to make clear those committees that are established by the board, appointed by the board, and subject to um, additional requirements. So really the committees that this board establishes to provide feedback and input, like the Long Range Advisory Committee, and others that are established by state law, such as the District Personnel Performance Evaluation Council, the Preschool Council, and the others that are identified in the cross-references. So here, as, as we have done, we've customized what the CASB sample is because there was some language in there that didn't really reflect the way we operated. So the point of the red line then is to clarify that we have board advisory committees, we have staff advisory committees that are just established to give input to staff, and then we have community groups and to really clarify that so that we're careful with our expectations for the board, staff and community around this work. So this is just up for study. So are there any questions board members for Kathleen? I just have one. One quick question, and, and, and uh, it's in reference to the uh, um, God, space that committee out now. <laughs> it's the uh, wow. Why am I uh, the Equity Council? Gosh, uh, that's a that's a staff advisory committee, correct? But don't we also expect the Equity Council to come up with recommendations to the board. Rob, do you want to answer that? Certainly. I think that there are recommendations that come from come before the board. Um, those recommendations would then come to staff that then would be presented to the board in some instances. So for example, when we studied SROs, those, those recommendations came to staff directly to the board. 
right? And some of the other work the Executive Council has been working on are recommendations like, so for example, um, Equity Council just finished um, six months in, in really thinking through our Grad Plus initiatives to giving us recommendations on implementation to ensure that we're being equitable. Um, and those didn't come to the board, those came, we shared them with the board, but those came to staff. And so as it stands today, Equity Council is a staff um, advisory committee. So on, on, on the uh, red line, on number two, I'm sorry, uh, red line on, on, on number two, where it talks about the staff advisory committees, um, and it goes on to say it shall be created by the superintendent or designee to focus on particular issues, blah, 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 blah. And then it goes on to say such committees are not advisory to the board, do not have board liaison and are not subject to Colorado Open Meetings Law. Uh, is there any way that we can clarify that so that we know that those advisory committees will make recommendations to the staff and as appropriate, the staff will make recommendations to or bring those recommendations to the board? Just to clarify. Yeah. Yes, thank you for that comment. Yes. Board members, any other questions about this policy? Do you have what you need, Kathleen? Yes, thank you very much. Is it right if we do the next one, then take a break? Yeah. Okay. The next policy item is policy BDFF, the Long Range Advisory Committee. My notes say Kathleen's presenting, but I see Rob at the lectern. So she's pointing to you. I'm happy to let Kathleen take it. <laughs> Do you want me to tee it up for you, Mr. Price? <laughs> Feel free. <yeah. laughs> so for those board advisory committees that are clearly being established by the board, the board will adopt a policy that sets forth the way that that uh, committee will operate, the focus of the committee. That's what we refer to as really the charge, so that the board is in fact establishing the scope of what they would like the committee to accomplish. We also took an opportunity to just align it and make sure it was clearly connected to BDF and that we're really clear about the requirements. What we want to make sure we don't do is establish, is to be vague on compliance with things like open meetings law and how the information will be shared. Knowing that long range planning is a really important community issue. This is an area where we've prepared a charge for the board to establish an advisory committee in this area. Mr. Price can tell you more about it. Thank you. So before you tonight is the draft charge of the new long range advisory committee. Uh, the purpose of the committee is to develop recommendations to ensure sound long term facility de decisions consistent with the needs of the school district and in support of the school district's uh, strategic initiatives. So again, this uh, committee is intended to provide a high level of accountability, engagement, and communication with our community to ensure stakeholders are engaged and their values and priorities are reflected in your decisions. I'm gonna go into a little bit of detail on each of these bullet points, but the first bullet point, review enrollment trends and facility utilization to identify data and information needed. This really addresses the need for the committee to review not only the raw data related to school utilization, but also the other information that paints a more complete picture for school enrollment throughout the district, such as programming, when we think of community Montessori, for example, resident population within a school district's bound, within a school's boundaries, open enrollment and geography, when we think of Netherland uh, Elementary, Netherland Middle Senior High, for example. In addition, the committee will have the opportunity to identify and request information from staff for other data points not previously identified. The second bullet point, review the school district's expanded programming, uh, program offerings and analyze cost-effective ways to provide spaces for these programs. Regarding this bullet, the community will, or the committee will need to look into two things, and that's uh, expanding some program offerings that we're already looking into, preschool, career and technical education, for example. And we'll also need to devise an efficient way to accommodate these needs. So in a declining enrollment environment, there are many opportunities to utilize vacant space. So uh, for example, making a school preschool only, if we think about Netherland and how that was done in the past. 
We'll also explore additional special uh, programs other than those already identified that could attract students to a building and utilize space more efficiently or identify programs that could operate from a de dedicated facility. Regarding the third bullet point, assess system-wide school and facility utilization and develop strategies to ensure an equitable distribution of program opportunities for all of our students. This gets into the one round versus two round as Dr. Fernandez presented uh, when we gave our enrollment outlook presentation. Um, regarding the fourth bullet point, provide periodic updates. Uh, the committee will maintain communication with the Board of Education through periodic uh, check-ins and produce a document of findings when ready. Again, as you remember in that or enrollment outlook presentation, this committee will start meeting in September. And the tentative timeline is we would bring back recommendations in April. And again, that is tentative. We'll have to meet as a group and make sure that timeline is achievable. Uh, as in regards to membership, we'll have up to 30 members on this committee and they'll be based upon the following stakeholder groups. Those stakeholder groups are listed. I'm not going to read through all of those. The appointment process, we will uh, create an online application process to be available on our, on our website. Then we will use uh, staff to review applications and present it, uh, candidates to the Board of Education. So the application process will begin after the board approves the charge on June 14th. So I anticipate that will happen in late June. We'll leave that open through late July, early August, and then we'll bring that back to the board at a board meeting in August with the anticipation that you would approve that. Meetings would start in September. Uh, the meetings will occur on a monthly uh, basis all the way through until we present the findings to the Board of Education. And then if the board intends to keep this committee running after that point, we would meet monthly or quarterly thereafter. So with that, I will open it up for questions. Richard? Uh, just a quick question on the composition. I know that we often appoint a board liaison to committees. Will there be one here too? I would leave that up to the board. Can we include language that maybe that we can appoint a board liaison to well, the composition? If that, it's our, that would it's be, our that committee, would be my they're reporting to the board. So, um, but if we want to have a board liaison, I think we can do that. I don't know what the will of the board is on this committee. I, I think it's a good idea. You know, because I know that CBOC also reports to the board, but we also have a board liaison there. The athletic committee also reports to the board, and we also have a board liaison there. I don't see why we shouldn't have one here. I think it's a good idea to put language in there that gives us the option to do that. Okay. Okay. Richard, anything else? No, I'm sorry. Okay. No, I just wanted to make sure. Anybody else have any questions about this long-range advisory committee? As a draft policy. I guess the only question I'd have, and certainly understand the, the board's desire to have a board liaison, um, you know, in consideration, do we think that that could influence or impact the potential recommendations that the advisory committee would come to with a liaison? Mm -hmm. I think it would just be clear that the liaison does not serve as de facto opinion of the board, right? And that, in the sense, you know, just clarifying the role of the board liaison might help clarify for the folks that are on the committee what the role of the board member is, right? You know, the, I think that as we think about the long range advisory committee, you know, what, what we've really talked about is, is, is just getting that, that collection of opinions and thoughts from our community to help advise us collectively. You know, the only worry would be um, is, is that somebody would miss, the board liaison is there to listen, you know, participate but not represent the it's just to report back to the board or they're reporting back to the board I guess that was the only thing to consider does that make sense I'm rambling Listen, a little bit so, so Kathleen looked like she wanted to say something it seems clear to me we would want to have some clarification about what the role is but I can tell you when I was on CBOC I wasn't there it, it provided more feedback other than periodic reports so if there were questions that CBOC would have I could bring it to the board but I certainly wasn't there representing the whole board 
So um, I think as long as we could include, I don't think we need to include it in the policy, but some kind of at the very first meeting, if we have a board liaison, some clear explanation to the board and to the committee as to what that role is. Um, I think that would be really helpful for everybody. Does that help, Rob? Well, and I also think that there's some sensitivity that the board should consider in regards to that you all are um, live within geographical areas, right? And th and that geographical areas are certainly differently represented as we think about long-range planning with some areas growing, some areas declining. Um, so maybe a little bit of different nuance. I think it's going to be fine. I just wanted to raise that to the board as, as, as something to consider. So potentially, Kathleen, as we write language, we can clarify the role of the, of the board liaison if, if the board feels like that would be an appropriate thing to do. Yeah, President Gebhardt, I mean, on CBOC, you were a non-voting member. Correct. Right. So we just want to clarify that then. Yeah, I, I felt like I was a carrier. When there was a question from CBOC, I could bring it back to the board. Um, but I didn't participate unless there were questions that they needed to have from the board, basically. Um, Kathleen, you look like you wanted to say something. My comment was also going to be about making clear that it's a non-voting liaison, which I think is how it is with DAC. And that's what I was going to say. That's how it operates in all of our other advisory committees. And so, and there's not specific language in all of those policies, to the best of my ability. Um, so I think we could operate similarly across all of our, mm -hmm. and all, and all of our advisory committees. But it seems that since this is a new one, it wouldn't hurt at the first meeting to just have some expectation so that people who may not know how that works, so that we can start off on the same page as we go forward. So. It is so, not noted here. I do want to note, I know Dr. Anderson mentioned it, we do plan to issue an RFP for a facilitator to at least guide us through this first phase. So we hope to issue that RFP after the charge is approved um, and have that facilitator on board by that uh, September meeting. Yeah, this is super important work, so I really appreciate you taking this forward because we have some big challenges in front of us and having our community engaged as we kind of try to navigate these kind of treacherous waters I think is going to be really helpful. So thank you. Any other questions, board members, for this? If not, um, it's up for study. Stacy. Regarding the um, members representing each community, um, would they represent where they live? Would they represent where their child goes to school? Um, you know, we have Broomfield High, which is 50% open enrollment from other communities. Would they be able to be on the committee? Just curious. Yeah, I mean, that we would, uh, the way we've done this in the past is they have to live in the community they represent. So um, they would live in Broomfield. We'd select two members from Broomfield. We'd select two members from Netherland. Uh, the mountain communities, for example. So uh, not where their schools attend, where their students attend, but where they live. Yep. Nicole? I just have one tiny comment on the second bullet under committee responsibilities, where it says expanding programming. We might not always be in a condition where we're expanding everything. And so I wonder if we can change that, some of that language in that bullet um, to reflect that sometimes we might be contracting in areas and expanding in others. All right, any, anything else? Otherwise, I think we'll be ready to have a comeback for action on June 14th, unless there's other. Rob? To Nicole's point earlier, the comment I made around clearly defining board liaison, maybe that's in BDF versus BDFF, because where it talks about um, board advisory committees, if that, if that makes more sense. So there's consistency. So this isn't different than something else. That's where we get with bad policy, you get these nuanced things. So. Um, I was the right board. there with you, boss. Yep. That sounds good. Yeah. Thank you, Nicole. That was, that was a good. Um, that, was, that was that was a good thing to point out. All right. Anything else? Thanks, Rob. We look forward to working together with this committee. So we're going to take a five-minute break, which will probably end up being ten, but we'll try to make it five, and we'll be back in a few minutes. So we're back in session, and the next item is a study item, and it's 
Bill Sutter presenting the proposed budget for our next school year. Uh, thank you, President Gephardt. Uh, let me bring up the presentation. So this evening, uh, we have the official 2022-23 proposed budget. Uh, we previously met on the preliminary budget. Um, so this is uh, uh, the next iteration. Uh, attached to the agenda item uh, is also the 200-odd uh, page uh, entire budget document. Uh, so all the detail is included uh, with this presentation attached. So I will be going over uh, general operating fund and other funds. Uh, real quick, the budget development timeline, input, projected enrollment, the proposed budget, and next steps. Uh, this is um, largely unchanged uh, since the pre previous presentation. Um, I will reference the numbers, uh, but uh, essentially nothing has changed since we last discussed. The, pro the budget development process and milestones, uh, so a nice bright red line where we are in the process uh, with uh, the next steps being tonight's meeting with the proposed budget uh, being brought to the board and the public budget input session. Uh, we had planned for the budget adoption on June 14th. Uh, that may or may not change with the uh, rescheduling of the meetings uh, that can be discussed. Uh, and then we will have some future information that will come to the district um, after the budget is adopted uh, that will help inform us into the revised budget. To review the budget development input real quick, um, numerous stakeholder uh, meetings, committee recommendations, uh, committee meetings, public presentations, and also 18 topics at uh, 12 different school board meetings and work sessions. So uh, a vast amount of budget development input uh, comes into the system over many, many months uh, to put this all together. Projected enrollment, uh, so as has been mentioned, we have our declining enrollment uh, that is projected uh, next year and uh, kind of continuing into the future uh, with that sort of slight decline uh, going forward. The highlights of the proposed budget, uh, 17 million committed to staff compensation, uh, 12 and a half million committed to additional school staffing programs, instructional materials and student supports, 4.3 million committed to facility improvements, custodial services and building maintenance, 2.2 million committed to address inflation pressures and food costs, maintenance materials, software and utilities, 1.5 million committed to software upgrades, IT equipment, and support. Uh, general uh, operating fund overview, uh, we have the changes. I've identified the changes uh, from when we discussed this at the preliminary budget. Uh, the slight change in revenue, these are uh, pretty exclusively one-time changes, uh, so that just adds to the bottom line of one-time resources available. Uh, a slight bit of budget balancing and rounding. Uh, when we go from the uh, preliminary budget where we're just looking at the changes uh, from uh, current budget, uh, then when we pull it all together and have the 400 odd million dollar uh, general fund budget, uh, there are a few things that get rounded and have to change just a little bit. So that's what that uh, $200,000 is referencing not a particular addition or subtraction uh, to the budget. And then in reserves, uh, this is not less reserves than was uh, identified as a percentage, uh, but just when, again, when we're doing the projection on the changes, uh, we project the change in reserves based on the new information. Uh, and this is just referencing that we don't need to increase the reserves quite as much to meet that 3% Tabor reserve and 4% contingency reserve. So uh, essentially just a little bit uh, additional ending balance uh, on one-time dollars available. 
on other funds, notable items, so food service, uh, food services fund, so 1.4 million for inflation costs on food and consumable supplies, and a 50 cent increase in meal prices. Uh, technology fund, so we are uh, eliminating the technology fund as a separate fund in and of itself, and it's being rolled into the general fund for accounting purposes, uh, which just makes the accounting process easier in the new ERP system. So all the activities are going to remain the same. Uh, it's just not a separate reported fund anymore. And we have included that $400,000 one-time expense for high school computer labs. Uh, then that expense will occur in the general fund. Capital reserve, uh, half a million dollars ongoing transfer for continuing uh, the implementation of a bus replacement cycle. And then in the operations and technology fund, uh, 1.9 million, uh, these are all one-time expenses as noted for planned maintenance uh, projects, 1.7 million for portables at Metalark, uh, half a million for uh, food service software implementation, half a million for capital project uh, staff transition, uh, and 400,000 one-time expense for IT network battery backup systems. Next steps. Uh, so here I still have referenced the June 14th budget adoption, planned budget adoption. Uh, we have until June 30th uh, for the statutory deadline for budget adoption, uh, and then all, all the way up to January 31st of 2023 uh, for making uh, any revisions to that adopted budget uh, in accordance with state statute. That is the end of the presentation, if there are any questions. Richard? Thanks, Bill. <laughs> Just one quick question on your uh, portables for Meadowlark. How many portables is that 1.2 million buying? Two. Two? Two. Thanks. That's a lot of money. Any other questions? I just have a quick question, Bill. So where in the revenue those, do the ESSER dollars show up that we got? Uh, they would show up in the um, grants fund, the uh, governmental um, grants fund. Uh, so because we've uh, created the plan and recognize those already, uh, we don't refer reference them again, uh, but they would, they'll flow through the grants fund. As, the, as they're expended, uh, it's a reimbursement process uh, to get those funds. And we're using those funds for our differentiated funding for the different schools? Correct. Um, and I just want to point out to the few people who are still listening, if they look at our budget book, there are several awards of our, for our outstanding CFO, Mr. Sutter, so congratulations again. Um, it's just comforting to know we have such a steady hand leading us through kind of these turbulent times, so thank you for that. Thank you so much. It's a it's definitely a team effort uh, with all the staff and business services putting those things together. Well, thank you. Um, any other questions? So we'll aim for the June 14th, but we still have to figure out agendas for June 7th and June 14th, and so we'll figure that out in the next day or two. We could bring it June 7th. If we could. So let's prefer. just figure out what the what our agendas look like for the next three okay. meetings. Uh, then the other question would be uh, consent or regular action. I would still prefer to have it regular. It doesn't really matter because we could pull it if it was on consent if there are questions. But let's put it on action and just figure out which of the two meetings we're putting it on. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. And our last study item. is an update from the Capital Improvement Plan Review Committee and staff. I see Mike has been patiently waiting for hours. So um, thank you for your patience, and I'm going to turn it over to Rob Price, who I think will then introduce um, Mike. So thank you very much. Turn it over to you. Good evening. Yeah, you're right. I am Tonight I am joined by Jeff Clay, our Capital Improvement Plan Review Committee Chair, and Mike McLaughlin, who is our co-chair. So I'm here tonight to provide an update on the district's work to identify and understand the current capital needs in the district. Our last report to you on this topic was in March uh, when we shared the result of the facility assessment. 
that was conducted by Gordian last year. Staff have continued to move this work forward, in, uh, in, which included convening a capital improvement plan review committee whose work we'll share with you tonight. To provide some context for the information that we're share, share tonight, I want to remind you of the events that led up to uh, this point. So the 2014 bond program is substantially complete. The work leading up to that bond program identified over $875 million in needs. 677 were invested to address a large portion of those needs. Last year, BBSD worked with Gordian to conduct a facility assessment. That information was presented to you on March 15th. Those results, uh, again, will be shared tonight. Around 18 months ago, the New Vista Working Group convened to consider how the district should proceed with the scope of work in the Educational Facilities Master Plan. That was the 2014 plan. Given that facilities conditions had changed dramatically since the 2014 bond had passed, that group recommended a rebuild of the New Vista School. In April, staff presented an enrollment outlook, which identified overall decline in the district, coupled with pockets of growth in Erie. A capital improvement plan review committee was convened in April, and we'll share their work later in this presentation. And a public opinion poll is underway. So beginning last summer, BVSD worked with professionals from Agordian who assessed over 5 million square feet of buildings and infrastructure. The teams evaluated major architectural, mechanical, electrical, and site infrastructure system components, estimating their in-kind replacement values where each is at within its expect expected life cycle. Data entry followed that on-site engagement, which now exists in a live database that's useful for projecting our capital uh, needs now and as time progresses due to the annual costing updates powered by RS means. A significant portion of the 2014 bond program was directed at maintenance and upkeep of major building components such as roofing, windows and doors, our mechanical systems, electrical and plumbing, as well as replacing some of our worn out materials such as carpet, uh, lighting, flooring, um, paint, et cetera. This work has reduced the deferred maintenance needs in the district where equipment and materials are past their life cycle from 73% to 6% in terms of square footage. We've extended our, ex extended our building life by decades by doing that work, thanks to our voters. So although we completed a significant amount of work in the 2014 bond program, we knew going into this we'd not accomplish it all. So our buildings continue to age. The assessment prioritized identifying requirements by urgency related to due date. Because of the work we accomplished in the 2014 bond program, the requirements due within the next several years is relatively small when we think back when we did our assessment 2012 and 2013. However, we still do have millions of work that needs to be addressed in the short term, short term being in the next one to two years. This slide just shows you some examples of the work needed to be complete. I'm not going to go through each one of these. You've seen this slide, but as you can see, work to our exterior building envelopes, site work, mechanical systems need to be uh, upgraded in some cases with the water pumps and the uh, boiler that you see in these photos. So all of the requirements within the database are categorized into one of five systems, building envelope, building systems, infrastructure site, safety and code, and space improvement. As you can see, 41% of the needs were within building systems, another 13% within the building envelope. These are just examples of the requirements of the systems. So just a little bit more detail. I'm not going to go through all of these, but building envelope, when we're talking about that, we're talking about windows, doors, roofing, brick and CMU, if we need to do tuck pointing or seal our, seal our buildings, et cetera. Last time we presented to you, we hadn't uh, completed our ADA assessment. The ADA assessment has been completed, entered into the database. It uh, came out with about $5.6 million of needs. So that information is now within the database. In January, the board supported the recommended, uh, recommendation of the New Vista Working Group to rebuild a new building on the same site. A portion of the project budget in the 2014 bond program was used for design for the new building and the remainder will be used towards new construction. 
So, however, additional funding is needed to complete the construction. We have completed schematic design drawings, and now we are done with design development drawings, and we'll be working on the budget as we move forward. As we have communicated several times due to growth in the Erie area, a new school will be needed to support the growth uh, from Parkdale and uh, students uh, within Metal Arc's attendance area. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on these two slides. As a reminder, Parkdale sits on the very Eastern boundary of the district. We have approximately 1,400 single family homes that will be constructed over the next five to 10 years. We expect that that Parkdale uh, development will have about 342 elementary students, 177 middle, and 223 high school students. Again, just a little bit more information on the growth that we anticipate out of Parkdale. Our old sled desks that exist in a lot of our old schools are okay for lectures and our student presentations, but don't work for most of the other modalities of learning team collaboration, peer-to-peer -peer tutoring, et cetera. So a few of our students would pick an uncomfortable sled desk, as you might imagine, as a place to sit and learn all day. A well-designed classroom will provide a variety of options a student could pick from. So new modern furniture is lightweight, movable, making it easy to quickly reconfigure classrooms. This furniture helps us create flexibility within an existing floor plan. The furniture is a lot more comfortable and gives students choices which we found to be extremely important. Here are a few examples of new furniture in our classrooms and different learning activities that occur. The new furniture has been well received by students and our educators. We would like to continue the effort to replace outdated furniture in our classrooms throughout the district. Earlier this year, BBSD announced our new Grad Plus initiative. We know that our graduates need more than just a diploma to be successful on their post high school path. Grad Plus creates opportunities for students to earn uh, college cr credit, industry certifications, work experience, or a seal of biliteracy. Two of these areas, work experience and industry certifications are made possible through the district's career and technical education programs, or CTE. These programs require learning environments that let students get hands-on experience in settings that mimic what they will see in their post-high school lives. We propose to expand CTE programs to all middle and high schools. To support this expansion, new CTE learning labs would be created at middle and high and K-8s. These programs would support vertical pathways that start in elementary school. Along with this program expansion, BBSD would be able to offer additional industry certifications. This expansion would also happen at Boulder Tech. So this collection of facility needs I've described tonight has been compiled in the list that we feel are critical to address in the next four years. So I'm gonna run down the list. Priorities one and two, that is the information that Gordian has presented to the Board of Education on March 15th. Those are deferred maintenance or uh, needs to improve our facilities. Upgrade uh, our building automation system. That's a $1.2 million. That is the system that we use to control all of our mechanical systems. We have $6.5 million to remove hazardous materials throughout our buildings. We'll continue to make headway with that. A new Vista High School replacement. These are construction dollars, and I'll explain that in a second. $27.6 million. The new Parkdale Elementary School, um, that is a 70,000 square foot, 500 student elementary school that is being proposed PK through five, 31.5 million. Expand CTE opportunities at all of our middle schools and K-8s. We have set aside $5.6 million for that expansion. Also includes an expansion of CTE opportunities at all of our high schools. That's six high schools, not including New Vista, as we're already de designing new VISTAs, so that's designed into the new design documents. Um, that amount is $13.2 million. Renovate Boulder Tech, uh, that is approximately a 30,000 square foot renovation for $8.2 million, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail after our Capital Improvement Plan Review Committee chairs present. We also included a uh, teaching kitchen at the Culinary Center. We have shelled out that space when we constructed that in the 2014 bond. 
So that would be a program for the current technical education students. We have included $25.7 million to modernize our classrooms with furniture, fixtures, and equipment throughout the district. We have about 3,500 classrooms. We will be doing that full assessment this summer. That assumes that about 70% of our classrooms still need to be furnished with FF&E. We have uh, included, as we feel it's extremely important to um, improve ADA accessibility on our playgrounds. And again, that is something that uh, SIPSI will address here shortly. Uh, we have worked closely with our special education department, identified those playgrounds that are of highest need, and we have included that, um, that amount. Again, as I mentioned, this list totals up to a subtotal of 245.4 million. We do include 30% on top of the construction cost. That is for a 10% contingency. Architect fees usually range from 8 to 10%. And then we have to have money in for permits, surveys, and then the cost to manage a program if it were to move forward. We have assumed a 15% inflation at this time. That would be 6% the first year, 3% the year after. That does need further study as we're moving forward right now. Uh, inflation can continue to grow somewhere, somewhere from 0.75% to 1% a month is what we're seeing. So we'll continue to hone in on that number. And then a program reserve of 2.5%, bringing the total critical needs budget to $376.1 million. So as a reminder, um, Capital Improvement Plan Review Committee, our purpose was to engage our community to discuss our facility needs. So in April, BBSD convened uh, Capital Improvement Plan Review Committee, which consisted of 23 community members representing the demographic characteristics and geographic range of the district. The purpose of this community group is to review and provide feedback on our 2022 BBSD uh, facilities critical needs list. So the committee will offer suggestions and advice to the board in order to assist it with its decision making process to capital improvement planning. The group has met four times over four weeks and discussed the following topics. So uh, facility assessment update, I presented that information uh, with Gordian. Uh, Kiffany Leitrek, uh, Director of Teaching and Learning, presented on the importance of furniture, fixtures, and equipment. Uh, Arlie Huffman, our Director of Career and College Connections, and Dr. Sam Messier presented on the importance of career and technical education needs throughout the district. Glenn Segru, our Senior Planner, presented on our enroll enrollment outlook, same presentation that you heard uh, a few weeks ago, and also presented information on our school utilization throughout the district. And then Bill Sutter, CFO, presented on the mill levy model and our legal debt uh, margin. So with that, I will turn it over to Jeff Clay, our chair of our Capital Improvement Plan Review Committee. Thank you, Bob, uh, and thank you to the board and Dr. Anderson for giving Mike and I some time uh, this evening to, to give you an overview of our, of our work over the past few weeks. Overall, the committee supports the needs identified by staff including two new schools, career and technical education improvements, and renovations to address facility deficiencies uh, as critical to address in the short term in order to maintain taxpayer assets, to provide essential high-quality learning environments for students, and to address uh, enrollment growth where we're seeing enrollment growth in the district. The committee did have some mixed opinions about the size of the needs package and required funding. Uh, with some members suggesting a larger package and one member advocating for a smaller package. One member encouraged the district to explore and consider the needs and experiences of faculty and students in the buildings, in addition to the list of critical infrastructure needs generated by Gordian. Another committee member asked for clarification regarding assumptions about a potential assessed value increase and resulting increase in debt limit. And uh, as Rob mentioned, uh, Bill Center did a really good job of explaining uh, uh, all the mechanics of how that works. Um, the committee discussed in detail the, uh, the identified CTE needs and asked about uh, what CTE improvements would look like at different locations, including Boulder Tech. Staff commented that in terms of equity, Arapahoe campus is well located to be accessible from all parts of the district. And overall, the group supported the need uh, for expanding CTE options. Uh, the committee offered a number of comments for consideration by staff and the board, and I'm going to throw it to Mike. 
to uh, have happen. Thanks. Good to be with you again tonight. So Jeff and I wanted to share with you some of the comments that the committee talked about and, uh, and give you an idea about um, kind of how that dialogue went. So one member mentioned that with the creation of gender neutral restrooms in buildings by converting existing single occupant restrooms, there is a need to assure that there's still sufficient restroom uh, uh, available for use by adults. Other committee members agreed this should be evaluated at all schools. One member commented that the Operations and Technology Fund should be renamed uh, the Maintenance and Technology Fund and used to address items on the critical needs list identified in the facilities assessment. One member suggested that reconsidering the best use of the new VISTA site, including providing additional CTE opportunities there. Others uh, noted that such changes might not align with the existing program at New Vista. Several committee members suggested evaluating the Arapaho campus to expand the space available for CTE programming and asked if more funding is needed to meet the demand. Some members suggested waiting until the long range advisory group had done its work uh, and the educational adequacy assessment has been completed to get the full picture of facility utilization and programmatic needs, particularly rated, uh, related to CTE and furniture. And members also cautioned the district to consider the impact of declining enrollment related to investing in improving buildings that may close. Um, so this was one as close to my heart. Committee members from the mountains and Broomfield asked the district to continue to be mindful of geographic equity, considering the distance to travel to Boulder Tech and supported integrated CTE improvements in all middle and high schools. So we did support that. And the majority of the committee supported buying furniture as a way to improve the feel and function of learning environments within the existing spaces. One member disagreed with using 30-year bond money to buy furniture that lasts 10 to 15 years. Uh, we talked with Bill about that. And then the majority of the committee supported expanding the allocation to make ADA playground improvements at all elementary and K-8 schools with the need. So those are our comments and observations. Uh, and Jeff and I are available if there's any clarification we can provide. So looking ahead to next steps. So earlier I mentioned that an opinion poll is underway. Uh, we will be receiving these results yet this month and then we'll share those with the board on June 14th. At that time, Dr. Anderson will make a recommendation for how to proceed with the funding, with how to fund those critical needs. Uh, depending, I'm sorry, I'm gonna rephrase that. On June 14th, Dr. Anderson will make a recommendation on what our critical needs are then the board will have to make the, make the decision on how we fund those critical needs. So depending on the direction of the board, staff will develop supporting the documentation for the proposed ballot measure, if that's where we uh, proceed with this work, and that would happen in June, July. And then we would preview, uh, preview the final critical needs list and proposed ballot language in early August. So in August, the board would have to approve the final critical needs list and the proposed ballot language for it to be on the ballot in November. With that, I do know I want to make sure that I address Nicole's comment or question earlier. So on the uh, athletic assessment, um, Harry and athletic directors have went out with our project managers, assessed all of our facilities. We prioritize just like they are in the Gordian database priorities one, two, three, and four. If they've made priorities one and two, they are in the assessment. We have a lot of synthetic turf fields, tracks, uh, field lighting that I know made priorities one and two. There are some improvements to locker rooms that also made priorities one and two, but there are also other items that did not make these uh, lists and priorities one or two, if that helps. The, yep. So those are currently listed and reflected in the numbers that you have presented? That is correct. And yep. how about our academic needs assessment? Where are we with that one? So what we've, um, from an athlete or from an academic needs assessment, what we've went through, uh, one, we've asked our principals through a survey what their needs were. We've costed those out, we've looked at those, we've prioritized in that, and that lives within the Gordian database. Again, some of those needs fell into priorities one and two, some did not. Um, we will also, and as, as I presented, I believe back in March, to do an educational adequacy assessment. So next steps with that would be 
to complete educational specifications and then use those educational specifications to go through our buildings to do a full assessment with a team of architects. So that work will play out over the next two years. It's not gonna be something we do uh, within six months. That's a long process. Lisa? I'm looking forward to this opinion poll. What else can you tell us in advance of sharing it with us? What, um, who's being contacted? How many folks? What kinds of questions are you asking? What, what should we be looking at in terms of how representative this is? Uh, um, 30 to 35 questions, uh, questions such as, would you support a new school for New Vista? We talked a little bit about the um, instruction that happens at New Vista, how many students are being housed in New Vista. Um, we talked about the need for a new school in Parkdale. So a lot of, do you support maintaining uh, district assets, community assets? So those types of questions, and then we got into the levels of would you support 290 million? Would you support 350 million? Would you support 400 million? Um, those went out via text and they will be making phone calls. So I believe we sent out 600 texts and they, they anticipate to get 600 responses to those texts, a lot more were sent out. And then I believe they are making 300 calls that they will then put into a summary that we will review. We will also find out the demographics. We will find out if uh, they have kids in the district, et cetera. Okay, and we'll get a full breakdown of that, I presume, along with the data? We'll get a full breakdown of what? The things you were describing, yep. the, the right, thank We'll you. present that. Richard? <clears throat> Following up on that uh, uh, question that uh, Lisa had on the opinion poll data, what do you consider a relatively safe opinion once the information is collected? I mean, the what what will you be looking for? Yeah, and we'll work with our consultant and we'll report back to you on that. I don't want to give you a specific number. Um, because I really don't know. I think we'll have to work with them and seeing what they're seeing within other communities. I know Bill uh, Sutter has a lot of experience on what we've seen on past elections, et cetera. So we'll collect that information, be able to report that back. And uh, just another question. Uh, so let's say that we move ahead and all of this, and I know that New Vista has been waiting for a new school forever, and let's say that the, not to jinx anything, okay, I hope that the bond doesn't go through. What happens to the New Vista promise? Well, we don't have the bond dollars to rebuild New Vista. So if that were, that would be, um, if that were the, the, the scenario, we would have to rethink through other opportunities to potentially fund that fund that um, project. Um, there are some other op options that are available. The, the problem with the options is they take general fund money for the most part. Yep. No, if there's they a, don't have yes. the bond money. Other questions? I know you're going to be shocked that I have a few. Um, and I have a question I forgot to ask Bill. So we got something from our, the county treasurer about the impact of the fire on our AV. Is that significant? Is it going to impact anything we need to do going forward? Or was it kind of in the realm of what you had said, which was not great news, but not terrible news? That one? <laughs> Maybe we could talk about that when you do the, <laughs> the bond. Because um, I know we are thinking about what the impact of the fire is on our ability to go forward and for people to be able to um, afford to pay increasing property taxes. And we'll have to consider all that because our mill levy is going to go up as a result of some legislation last year. So we have a lot of moving parts to figure out on this. Um, on the ADA numbers, Rob, are, to me, those seem like a high priority. Are those all included in at least tier one or tier, tier two or whatever it is in addition yep. to the playground? I'm assuming there's ADA issues that are not playground related. Is that true? That is true. And they're all in priorities one or two. So if this bond was to pass, we would fix all of our at least current ADA issues that we know of. Yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah, that's to go and say all is a big okay, step. But, right, but what was identified would be addressed. Yep. Um, and then I think 
maybe for the June 14th meeting, some of these presentations to the committee I think would be really helpful for the board. So are there, were there slideshows like for the um, computation of legal debt margin or the school utilization? Would we have access to that information before we have to, I know we don't have to make a decision in June, but we kind of have to continue, decide whether we're going yeah. forward still or not. So I think I, it'd be really helpful to I believe to we have. provided it, but I will get all of that information. It does live on a website. We have made that all public, but we will get you that information. I, I just think that would be really helpful. Um, I just want to say thanks to, to Mike and to Jeff because this has been a heavy lift in a short period of time, and I really appreciate them stepping up. Um, they've been kind of our partners all along from CBOC to whatever the next vision's going to be, and um, everybody has really busy lives and schedules, and so thank you to you and to the committee for, for stepping up. And so are we, board members, are we pretty clear on what the next steps are? So we won't, we'll hear from you on the 14th. We know that all this information, if we need it, is available on the website, and we'll get the, the survey data back then. Nicole? So in the comments that they presented, they mentioned uh, creation of gender neutral bathrooms in all of our schools. Is that something that that is in our current priorities, or is that outside of that? packet. So some of the recommendation are, uh, that came out of the Capital Improvement Plan Review Committee are not included in our current priority list. So that is an assessment that we need to do this summer to make sure that we do have the accurate number of facilities within our school. So that is one, um, as, as Mike and Jeff presented, looking at all of our playgrounds and making them accessible, some additional uh, assessment work that we need to do this summer and then expanding career and technical education even further is some other work that we need to discuss with Dr. Messier, Arlie, and others to see what that would look like. Those are some recommendations that came out of the committee is to expand some of those scopes. And we would have potential numbers for those in June or prior to potentially deciding whether or not we go for this? Yeah, we'll give you updates as we're moving forward, but ultimately that will come back to the board in early August when we'll present the final list, and then we would have to take action uh, at that first board meeting in August. So that was one of my questions, is that even after June 14th, there's a, a lot of work that needs to be done between June 14th and August when we have to make a decision that you'll be working on over the summer. That's what, yeah, staff will be working in June and July on that work and then present it to you in early August. I would be remiss if I didn't remind the few people listening that the state got billions of dollars in an ESSER funding and gave zero for capital construction for schools. So all of this still falls on our lap to be able to make our facilities something that are um, suitable for our students and maintain the assets of the public. It was just very discouraging that our state didn't, continues to believe that they have no responsibility in making sure that our schools are safe and sound places for our staff and for our students. So um, that's why we have to do this is because even after all those billions of dollars, we're still on our own for doing this. So thank you for bringing that forward. Um, I don't think that, Rob? I just want to thank Rob Price and his team for taking on this massive amount of work doing an incredibly high quality job in a short time frame. Um, just as a reminder to the public, uh, we wanted to start these conversations in January when the Marshall fires just were not able to do that. And so our timeline has been compressed, but we have not sacrificed on quality whatsoever. Rob and his team have worked overtime to make this uh, to, to make this a reality and to put the board in a position to be able to make a decision on, on how to proceed. And so I just want to thank Rob and the team, um, Mike and Jeff, uh, just thank you so much for your time and effort and energy and everybody who's served on our capital improvement planning committee. And I'm coming together uh, frequently in a short amount of time and giving us really good feedback on where we are. Looking forward to the polling results and uh, and making a recommendation at our June 14th meeting for the board to consider. Board members, any other questions? Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Jeff, up there on the screen. Um, so board members, as you recall, at our April 26th meeting, the board adopted our revised policy BEDB. This new agenda category, future agenda requests, is now a standing category featuring our agenda setting discussion. Um, are there any items that we haven't talked about that board members want to raise at this time? 
All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? Kitty, seconded by Beth. Yeah, I wish everybody a happy and safe Memorial Day weekend, um, and we'll see you <laughs> in early June. <laughs>